Hello, everyone, and welcome to the premiere episode of Cats Corner. Guys, this show features movie reviews from Cats extensive collection of physical media, which you can see directly behind her. And I'm so excited to get started with this series. Catherine, how are you today? Quite very good. Thanks for, thanks for this. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, of course, Catherine, every time I do a show with you, I can always see your collection behind you. And, you know, the first thing that I always want to do is, gee, what did you get in this week or what's <laughs> been going on? And you've been so kind to always share all of the physical media that you get with us uh, for those of us in the PGS community. And now being able to do a show where we get to talk about your specific collection is such a treat. So, Catherine, I wanted to ask you, what selections have you made for us today? All right, I have a co combination of steelbooks and regular movies. I didn't pick all of them because there's so many, but we're going to stick with just the letter A today. Uh, okay. Inspired by our fellow YouTuber, Robert Meyer Burnett, who did his, uh, who started his A to Z series, which was quite fun. Uh, so on the A side of things for my regular non-steelbook ones, first, American Graffiti. Uh, this is my all-time favorite movie because I did not have a life in high school. And the idea of watching... People just like hanging out. It's like a hangout movie, basically. I love the music. I like the cruising culture. And I like how he kind of flips convention on its head. Like, you know, the nerd gets his night. The badass, the guy who thinks he's a badass street racer gets stuck carting around a 12-year-old, but actually has fun. The nostalgic bookworm who has no reason to be nostalgic or socially awkward ends up uh, getting abducted by a street gang back in the era when street gangs weren't dangerous, but were just silly. And he ends up having fun running around breaking the law and doing all this type of stuff. And a great drag race sequence. So I just really lo absolutely love this movie. I definitely want to see a 4K transfer. I've heard from Twin Flicks that there might be one in the making because this is the 50th anniversary year of this film. So that uh, I, I, I really do like it. What do you think of this one? Yeah, I love American Graffiti. You know, of, of course, anybody who loves uh, 1950s, even 1960s Americana will love this film. And honestly, just the simple uh, beauty of the film, the cruising element is a lot of fun. Um, you know, everybody can relate to the cruising. I think that the cinematography of the film does also... Uh, really heighten the excitement of it because you feel like you're going cruising along with everybody in the film. Um, and I also think that the actors, obviously the group of actors who are in this um, is just a laundry list of famous actors and directors we know today, uh, but it is just so beautifully done and it feels like you're, you're being transported right back to that era and time in the United States that a lot of people have so many fond memories of. I think it's a masterpiece, maybe one of the best films ever made because it just so simply shows us such a beautiful time um, in American history, a simpler time, a time where, um, you know, a lot of our ideals and, and uh, desires are actually able to be met um, in, in such a, a beautifully uh, done way on film. So I think it's a fantastic film. And I actually have it DVR'd. Um, Turner Classics had it on the other day and I didn't have a chance to watch it. So I DVR'd it and I'm going to watch it again. I love that film. I think it's just really an essential film, Catherine. Yeah. And then it's also impressive how, you know, they shot it in just four weeks and everything they're doing for a low budget crew is very new, like getting the cameras to mount on the cars and all of that. And it, it's, uh, they filmed it, uh, not too far away, like another 50 miles away from here. So in Petaluma. Uh, so this is, yeah, I, I, I absolutely love this film. Uh, and I love classic cars. I used to have one. I still have a few, but <laughs> all right. Uh, next one is my favorite documentary of all time. The act of killing. Oh my God. This, is, this was um, released in 2012. The documentary went to Ind Indonesia and spent roughly 10 years there. And it was a, a, the historical background is that during the Cold War, Indonesia started basically purging its Communist Party and other, you know, socialists and undesirables, if you will, people that were deemed they were going to be a problem. And they got help from Western embassies uh, to comprise a list of the so-called undesirables. And what they would do is recruit these street gangs to go around and basically abduct and kidnap and torture and eventually kill people who did not fit the, you know, fit their motif. And the the antecedent he presented for the film is imagine if the Nazis have won the war and the SS 50 years on are celebrated as heroes as opposed to monsters. And that's kind of what this is. And he's living with these, these killers for again, like a decade filming and following them around. And 
One of the best scenes in the movie is actually a scene the director wasn't even there to shoot. It was one of the second ADs who left the camera on and the other, the killers being interviewed didn't realize they were on camera and they had this kind of heated exchange between themselves. Like, should we really be telling everybody this stuff and all the stuff we did? It's like, well, maybe it's time for the truth to come out because at the time they were filming this, there was kind of like a social reckoning in Indonesia over all these horrible things that were done. And it's interesting because the, the main character, for lack of a better word, is one of these killers and he based his actions when he killed all, when he did all this stuff on American gangster films from the forties. And he apparently is feeling guilty about it because there's a film within the film. Like he's trying to film a movie of his nightmares and everything. And he's, it's really dark because he's trying to kind of exonerate himself for all the horrible things he's done. And even has a dream sequence where the people he's killed are forgiving him and like heaven. And it's so bizarre. And there's also things that are really dark. Like when the director goes to the, one of the cultural administrators homes, like a really rich guy. And he's showing off all his collection of stuff, which he basically stole from people that they massacred and talking about how rare and beautiful it is. It's so dark and it just, but it was done so well. And this is the director's cut. It's about two hours, 40 minutes, as opposed to the two hour theatrical cut, an excellent film. And it's really shows you what a documentary can do because it's edited out of sequence. Cause much like in real life, doesn't unfold like a movie with a convenient beginning, beginning, middle and end. So he had to edit it around to make the story make sense to the people that are watching it. But, but it's, and you'll notice that too, as you see that the age of the characters seems to change between the edits. Cause it's again, over a 10 year period, but this is an excellent film, highly recommended complete coincidence that the first two movies that we're covering are the, my, my favorite fictional movie, my favorite documentary, but there we go. So I, if you haven't seen it, I, I highly, my highest recommendation for this one. I'd love to see it. And I, I, I'd love to do a watch party of this uh, particular documentary with you, um, Catherine, certainly here on the Burnett work um, of this film, especially since it has been held in such high regard from what I understand. And I think it's very interesting um, that they chose to do a documentary versus doing a feature film, which we see a lot of dramatizations of films like this. And I think it's so important for us to go ahead and see something uh, that is an actual documentary versus a dramatization of events like this. Uh, we certainly do get a different perspective and maybe even a more realistic one when we remove ourselves from, from the desire to draw um, you know, world events like this. So I'm looking forward to seeing this film. Yeah. And in fact, that once the film finally came out, the director's like, I'm not going back to Indonesia because now he's probably person non grata there because he, because there was also a very bizarre culture of fame there where even though he made it clear what type of documentary he was making, like the highest regards of the political sphere were inviting him into their homes and really excited to see him because they loved the idea that they're hamming it up for the camera seemingly it's like he told them like well this is the movie i'm making and they didn't seem to some of them didn't seem to grasp it until much later in filming or when it finally came out and there's actually a companion piece called the look of silence where he had the family of one of the killers meet one of the surviving victims which was like a reckoning type thing uh, not as good as this but it's again this is my highest recommendation that's a great idea if you never want to do a watch party that'd be a, a amazing film all right uh Next, I have two from one of my, my favorite, my currently favorite actor to have not yet won an Oscar, uh, Mads Mikkelsen. Uh, first is Another Round. This is the Danish film which won Best Foreign Film at the Oscars two years ago. In the running in the same, that uh, was another Danish film that he was also in that come, will come up when we get to the R's. But this is really neat because their relationship with alcohol is very different in the United States. The drinking age is lower. Teenagers can drink and they don't have as much of a drinking problem, probably because it's not as much of taboo. And the plot is basically that these four teachers, middle-aged teachers, whatever, decide that they read a report saying that humans' baseline for alcohol consumption is like 0.05 or something. And I can't remember the exact number, but, oh, if we just consistently remain at this alcohol level, our lives will be great. And so they start doing this, and you see how it has differing results. Some, it goes really well for them. Others, it just, it turns out really horribly. But it's a drama. It's very good. Uh, don't let the, even if you don't speak the language, don't let the the subtitles bother you. Uh, I I guarantee there's you're, if you're not somebody who watches foreign films is afraid of the subtitles. One of my advice we is if you start reading a lot more, you'll be on, you'll end up reading so quickly that when subtitle when you get back to watching foreign films, when the subtitles are on the screen, you're going to register it so fast it's not even going to be a distraction anymore. That's that's my piece of advice on that. But a, a very great film. I don't understand why there wants to be an American remake, which. Again, completely different culture of alcohol, so it's not going to work. But this is a great movie. 
Yeah, I am concerned about that. I mean, if they were going to remake it, I would say it maybe even a British remake might be possible, make a little bit more sense. But I think that there, so a lot of times, um, and they've kind of talked about how uh, there's been a little bit of pushback in foreign language films, or let's say lang films made not in the English language, a non-English language film. And, you know, I think a lot of, uh, a lot of, um, producers and directors are trying to accommodate people who don't necessarily want to read, um, you know, subtitles. But I don't think, I think that if we really do want to get a lot of the idiomatic expressions and understanding of the culture behind what they're trying to show us in the film, you have to watch it in the native language and just read those subtitles because a lot is lost. Um, when you go ahead and decide to do the dub over and Catherine, I'm sure you've seen these dub overs, they, dr they try their best, but they just are not the same quality of acting. And, you know, and that's okay that it isn't, it's just, you know, you don't get the same feeling. And I love Mads Mikkelsen. And of course, just like you have been watching him pretty much for his whole career, he's been such a fantastic actor. I remember when this film came out, how people were praising it and we're hoping that it would get a little bit more recognition, a few more accolades. So I'm looking forward to it. I have not seen that film either and I'm looking forward to that. And I'm so glad that you're recommending it. Oh yes, this is a very, very good film. I think you'll like it. Uh, I think you'll like it a lot. So that'll be something to check out. Uh, another Mads Mikkelsen film I have here is uh, Arctic. Uh, yes. <laughs> this is a very minimalist film. Basically, there's a guy stranded in the Arctic. He, it, because of a major storm, he can't get to the, he's a scientist and can't get to his escape ship. Uh, and a plane crashes and there's a survivor, but she's really injured and he realizes he has to get her out of here. And it's just trucking across the Arctic escape. And it's like, you know, survival movie, similar to things like All is Lost, which was just Robert Redford on a boat. Yes. Uh, and, and this is just basically Mads Mikkelsen trying to drag this girl across the, the Arctic and trying to figure out how you're going to survive. And it's like, you know, one of those movies that you watch for the performance. And it's, I, I thought it was quite engaging uh, for its type. But I would, I would recommend this movie. Yeah, I've seen this film, uh, Arctic, as well as All is Lost with Robert Redford. And I absolutely love this genre of film. And Catherine, you're right. There isn't very much... Uh, you know, there's no dialogue almost in this film. A lot of it is a, just almost completely visual, a lot of acting. And oftentimes, just like in As All Is Lost, it's arduous. You can see that the actor is really kind of put through a lot. Arctic looks like it was filmed in a cold climate. It doesn't look like some kind of studio uh, type of film where they're on a lot somewhere. It looks like they're really out there in the elements. And a lot of times what he's dealing with are very dangerous situations, just like in All Is Lost, where, of course, Robert Redford is stranded in, in the ocean because of I think he hits a container in that particular scenario and it damages his boat. So, you know, somehow he has to survive through that. But in Arctic, it's really interesting. You know, it was quite a twist when he runs across this woman in the film I wasn't expecting that to be part of his journey and so then all of a sudden now he's responsible for two people Catherine you know the stakes are even higher as he's trying to survive this and it really there's a there's this really you can hear that the clock ticking in Arctic it's almost as if he's running out of time as each passing moment goes by where if he doesn't find refuge, he's really just going to be, you know, things are just going to go terrible for him. But I couldn't quite figure out why there was that sense of time in it, but it does make it for a more interesting film. It doesn't feel like he's sort of out in the middle of nowhere, you know, with an expansive ice flow all around him. And he just has all the time in the world. He doesn't have all the time in the world, you know, and I think Mads does a great job of pulling this off. It's not easy to carry a film where there are no words and it's it's not easy to pull off a lot of this arduous stuff. And I always say, you know, a man really is the person who can survive these incredible, um, uh, you know, survival stories that only somebody with a lot of experience like Matt, he's a mature man. Of course, Robert Redford's a mature man when he did All Is Lost, as someone with the experience of knowing what to do at each point and making the best, you know, making lemonade out of those lemons that they're given. And But this is to the extreme. And I think that this is one of his best films. Uh, certainly the shows what I always like to say, the brute survival ability of, of a man, in particular men. And I love watching men uh, survive extreme conditions like this. So I enjoy that film tremendously as well and I would recommend it to anybody who wants to learn about even how the movie making process or how to uh, show a story being told without having to have a whole bunch of dialogue in it. It is possible and those show, these films certainly do show that. Yeah and to put it even in better perspective I 
I first saw this movie on an airplane and it didn't bug me that it was on a tiny screen. I was engaged watching this on the back, tiny little screen. That's how good this movie is. So I, I and then it was even better when I got to watch it on, I mean, granted this isn't a 4K, but to see it on my big 4K TV was even more impressive. Mm -hmm. uh, of course. <laughs> now I'm going to get into some of my steelbook collections here. So the first one is uh, one of my favorite steelbooks just for the design. We have Alien, the 40th anniversary 4K steelbook. Uh, this was, of course, I saw this in theaters because they, they put it back out for the 40th anniversary for one night only in October 2019. I had never seen it in theaters before. The 4K transfer is absolutely gorgeous. Um, I actually think this is the best film in that series. I know most people say the second one. But I like that it's, you know, it is the truckers in space vibe. It is built on tension and suspense. It's not, you know, it's not like a gory type. Yeah, there's a one gory scene in it, but that doesn't like override the movie like you see in a lot of schlocky monster films. Like this is really good, particularly the scene in the air ducts with Dallas. Like That is so great. Um, I agree with Ridley Scott that it, as heartbreaking as it is, like the whole kill your darlings thing, cutting the scene out in the engine room where Ripley finds Brett and Dallas is a, the right move because the momentum stopped when they went to that scene, whereas in the theatrical cut is much better. But I think those scenes are still viewable in here, not in the 4K one, but in the, the Blu-ray director's cut, So, which is not a director's cut. That was a you know marketing ploy. But this the original theatrical cut of Alien, excellent film. Not much else you can really say about it that hasn't been said by 10 million other people, but I love how the glossy design of this steelbook, one of my favorites uh, as far as steelbooks go. Yeah, you know, it is interesting because Alien has had such a huge influence over uh, movies pretty much since it first came out. And I just like the close-ups of mm -hmm. the film. And there is a lot of, of parts where there isn't a lot of speaking again uh, in the film where they're just kind of going through their day-to-day -day routines. And, and you have to kind of pay close attention to what's happening and how things would be are different from what their normal routine, how this thing starts to disrupt them. And, you know, they're pretty much not prepared for this, although they, I'm sure they have protocols. I'm sure there's a bunch of written things and documents that they're supposed to follow according to procedures, but this really kind of knocks all of them off their feet. And it is very interesting to see. I would love to see the 4K. I've never seen the 4K version, but to see, you know, it remastered in that way, I'm sure it looks spectacular. I do like the way the ship looks. I still enjoy looking at the, at the ship, the Nostromo uh, in the film, even just, it still feels very spooky and, and very haunting. It's not a ghost story, but there's something about it that feels very ghost-like. Uh, and, and I think that that's just something so beautiful that they capture. And people are still trying to get that feeling. We watch so many films that just copy this method over and over again, Catherine, uh, the ship that's out in deep space and, you know, there's nobody out there and, uh, you know, they have to handle this, but it is just such a perfect film for me. I, I think it's it's really unmatched and you can watch it over and over and over again and still get enjoyment from it. Uh, so that certainly does say something about how, you know, the production value of an excellent film can be. D definitely. Uh, and of course, the, what H.R. Giger's contribution, amazing. Like Dan O'Bannon just slid the, the art book Necronomicon across the table to Ridley Scott and he's like this. And he's like, yeah. <laughs> and that's just... And then to your point about it feeling spooky, like he had his own little art studio in the corner of the, the actual studio and nobody would really come to see him very much because they thought he was kind of hearing, but there's still Giger pop-up bars and, and other places that would be really great to go to. But that, that, that's just an exceptional, uh, exceptional film. A much less exceptional film, which I received as a gift, but I just figured I'd show it off because the steelbook looks great, is uh, Alien Covenant. Um, yeah. I think this has the worst piece of lore in the whole series to say that a robot on a power trip created the Xenomorph in, in response to his frustrations with really dumb humans. Bad. But I love the production design of the film. And I like that the last half hour or so is more or less like a tribute to the original movie because it eventually comes down to just your two human characters and the one Xenomorph on the ship. And it was kind of neat to see that with modern effects and, uh, you know, mo you know the, a modern uh, that whole modern look. And so... Yeah, that's the back back of it there. So steelbook design was rather nice, but again, this movie, and it, I think it was not, I mean, the lore makes it terrible, but on the whole, in terms of enjoying it as a monster movie, I liked it better than Prometheus, which was a, uh, but again, it's kind of a stinker, but I thought I'd show it off just because it looks kind of neat. Probably. Yeah, and and uh, you know I can see where they were where they were trying to go with having uh, Fastbinder play 
um, this particular, um, you know, uh, AI. I understand what they were trying to do, but I, I also am not necessarily convinced that it, he was acting independently. I think he was programmed to be doing this. And, you know, I, I always believe that, you know, there he hooks into the mainframe every time. And whenever he gets more information, he puts into it. And there are commands that tell him what he should be thinking. So the notion of him being sort of this independent thinker or having an idea of his own, it's just, I don't really believe it. I still believe that, you know, the company are the ones who are telling him what to believe, just like we find out that the company is the reason why, you know, her, yeah, uh, you know, Ripley's ship isn't found for 50 years. You know, mm -hmm. there are very specific reasons why these things are happening. And he's not sort of an independent thinker at all. He's been programmed. So I, I do, I can't remove that from my mind. Right. Because was so focused on Catherine uh, in the story. And of course, um, you know, these, the programming he, so for me, he's not really a, like a, a, a sentient AI. He is just a robot to me. I know that he doesn't look like that. He looks very realistic and very sophisticated, but that's all meant to fool you. Um, and I think that they do fool you. And that's the, that's the gift, the amazing part of it, um, the accomplishment there but they were not prepared to necessarily deal with those repercussions of what it means. Like, for example, when he, I think there's a scene where he kind of like destroys part of the planet. And, and I'm thinking to myself, that's not his thoughts. Something has been told to do that. They want to be in sole possession, uh, perhaps of uh, more of, of whatever it is that is uh, important to the company. So um, sometimes I think it can lose sight of that, you know, although, at, and then we'll have moments where I think there was a scene where someone was told, well, you know, um, uh, your original AI is here. He's here, you know, he's here to tell you this. This isn't the robot, this is him. And of course it's the robot. And we like to see stuff like that because yeah. we know that, yes, the, the whole motivation has nothing to do with whether they care about you. It's the company and, and sort of that, that evil part that, that contributes to the welfare of the alien. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, that's the part I like to see. I love how they, that presentation in, that you have in your hand certainly does. Uh, they want to go into this um, idea of evolution of the alien, which is a creature that is constantly evolving at an, an a spectacular rate, um, maybe even more than microorganisms are. Uh, so even in that regard, the accomplishment for me is the fact that the alien can evolve and still be an, a living being without having mistakes. Like, wouldn't there be a bunch of mistakes if any other type of creature could do that? But no, this one is a perfected version of that. So that's what they're trying to go after and get from, from the alien. I think this is just my theory. This is my alien theory, but certainly the artwork and, and that book, everything in it is a treasure to just enjoy over and over again. Oh, for sure. And I just got the, uh, recently the two, J.W. Rinsler books, The Making of Alien and The Making of Aliens, you know, the late great J.W. Rinsler should add, exceptionally a, a treasure trove of information in there as well. And it's such a shame we're not going to get more of those from him. But uh, it, yeah, it's just, nothing better can be said about the way to make this stuff. But uh, that that's another, that was, I figured I would show that one off for the, that possibility. Uh, next one, one of my favorite films of the early 2000s, uh, Almost Famous. This is the extended, the bootleg cut, as they call it. Uh, this is a recent 4K from, I, I believe, a year and a half ago or so. Uh, it, loosely based on Cameron Crowe's experiences as a teenage Rolling Stone writer for a band. And they, of course, come up with fake names and pseudonyms for everybody in this. I really like it because it does feel like, you know, a 70s band road movie. Like, I don't feel yeah. like I, I need to watch any docu music documentaries after this because so many of them have the same, the sameness to it. It's like, Hey, you're on the road. There's going to be drinking. There's going to be drugs, groupies and <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Which is why I, in general, don't only really like mu musical or musicians biopics because it's the very same thing. Small town sensation. They meet a big producer, uh, drugs, money, sex, rock and roll. They crash and burn. And then they got to be humble to make a comeback. Same thing over and over again, which is why in general, I don't find musicians life stories to be that interesting, but almost famous kind of sums up what a tour is like. The, the good and the bad and the extended cut is fantastic i love this movie it made my top 30 for the decades of 2000 through 2009 uh what, what do you think about this one 
I loved it too. And of course, uh, you don't know this, but Billy Kudrow, who I believe is in this film, is one of my favorite actors. I love that man. Um, when he broke out onto the acting scene, you know, I practically everything he's ever made, I've seen. And I feel that he certainly adds this different type of aesthetic to a film um, that I can't quite put my finger on. But the, the actors in the film uh, were just absolutely remarkable anyway. And of course, I always say that this was the last It Girl that we had. And I know that's not true, Catherine, but it feels like she was the last It Girl. And when I say the It Girl, you know, I mean, in printed media and you see this uh, young lady around as an actress everywhere and they're talking about her career and she's on the tip of everybody's tongue. Um, certainly, uh, that was the case with this film and it was deservedly so. Um, but I, I also think that uh, the young actor who plays, uh, you know, who was based on in the story where he kind of leaves home and goes on the road. And it's not typical of something you could necessarily see today. This is not something you could focus on because culture has changed so much. But I remember, you know, as a child of the eighties growing up with this, it was possible to go on a tour like this. And this was very important to the career of a lot of of these artists. So that type of important cultural uh, experience of a band going on tour was true. The groupies existed. The magazine people who cover it were there. The after parties, the hotel parties, um, that big, you know, event, that big event, whether it was Woodstock or something else that the band booked, and then they suddenly are overnight sensation where everybody knows their name. That whole experience is something that everybody goes along with the ride for, with the band. So this was, you know, maybe one of the best, uh, almost, I guess you could say it's a dramatization even of um, an amalgamation of real life events. It certainly does feel very real. The, I even liked the touch where the, the young, um, the young reporter, um, his sister becomes a, a, a flight attendant and they include that in the film where he's kind of, you know, going from the airport to airport. It looks like he doesn't know anybody. And there's his sister, you know, in her Pan Am or whatever it was uniform, which was a little bit of, uh, you know, history there, which was a big deal um, oh. at the time. <laughs> so I think that they really had a lot of touches of, uh, you know, this person's life that was amazing, but also band culture, groupie culture um, done in, in, I personally think, a tasteful way. It wasn't sort of, you know, where someone, you know, we see so many horrible things. It was maybe celebrating all the fun stuff of what it meant. And the scene where they sing the Elton John song, I think, was very interesting as well. Um, certainly uh, paying homage to him in the film, you know, one of the greatest bands or let's say showmen of that era and going even on to today uh, makes almost famous maybe uh, something that everybody wants to make a film like this. Uh, yeah, and it just, it's one of those, it feels like what I call a snapshot movie. It just, it's, it accurately captures, or at least it feels like it accurately captures, again, I wasn't there. But from hearing what other people who actually did live through it had to say about this movie, I would say, okay, it is a snapshot film. It does kind of recapture that whole essence and feeling of, again, that whole thing that you don't see as much anymore. When back in Rolling Stone was considered a bigger deal for covering this type of stuff. And again, the fact that his sister's a flight attendant does make it easier to zigzag and keep up with everybody. And that whole culture, which just, you're right, it doesn't really exist in the corporatism of America, if, if you will, like the days of just... Like when my dad even would walk onto the airport at Van Nuys and he'd be allowed to work on somebody's P-51 just because he had the experience and be hired on the racing team. No, no problem. You don't need any credentials, nothing. So days like that are come and gone, you know? And, and the, But this is like a celebration of that. Like I just found out yesterday that the, the Reno Air Shows have been going on for 50 years. Reno Air Race is canceled. No, this will be the last year ever because it's just been that culture is just going, you know, going the way of the dodo. And it, this is kind of, similar thing it's like a celebration because even in the year 2000s keep reading these movies that old now uh, but even then it was sort of like celebrating a bygone time even though it wasn't in the year 2000 it had only been like 25 years on or so because this i believe takes place in 1973 so you know it wasn't that much lighter after afterwards but it still felt like it would been a lifetime because of how much the culture changed just in those few decades Absolutely. It's it's definitely on a must-see. And I think people really want to make films like this, but it's not always easily easy to do. Um, you know, whoever decided, whoever did the screenplay on this decided to be very careful in what they chose to show and not show. 
And, you know, we don't see any egregious scenes, but we do see it's realistic. If you're going to have sex with somebody, it, there's going to be nudity in the room. Like if he's, if this young man's going to take his clothes off, then he takes his clothes off. It's not sort of treated in a way that's overly salacious or, or ridiculous even, which we've kind of seen in a lot of films that are trying to be somewhat more graphic. But this film doesn't need to go over the top in order to get its point across. It does it perfectly. And I think, honestly, I think it's suitable for a lot of different ages, let's say over the age of maybe 15 or something like that, or 16, where you could watch this film and understand what's going on and not be shocked or, um, you know, trying to figure out why they're doing certain things. It's very, very I was probably 12 years old when I saw this movie and it didn't, and that was like the same year that it came out. It didn't bug me. I got it. I could follow it and get it. And that's what part of what made it really fun. <laughs> But yeah, it's, 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 yeah, totally agreed. Uh, so that's another one of my grit. That's one of my favorite steel books there. Another one that is, of course, a classic, uh, American Psycho. Yes. Yeah. has a, uh, Oh, wow. That's so cool. I, <laughs> oh, that's so cool. <laughs> what he acts on the back <laughs> and then sliding that off on the front, like the plastic is pretty cool. Uh, yeah, th this again, I remember was a, considered a really big deal when it came out. I bet I didn't see this one till quite a few years later. Mm -hmm. But when I watch it, I'm like, okay, I get, I get this total obscuring of America, corporate America and stuff. Uh, great performance from Christian Bale. Memorable scenes, for sure, that definitely deserves its place in the pop culture zeitgeist of today. Yeah, it certainly does. And I know that it was actually um, based on a novel. Um, but to be honest with you, I think that the the film certainly uh, has become uh, something that uh, I don't think anyone thought it would become as popular as it became. And I think a lot of the popularity is because of Christian Bale's taking this so incredibly seriously, even to the point where he's uh, there's a scene where he's looking at the the cards, the business cards. And I'm sure, you know, business cards aren't anything we see as common as we did before with the, you know, the we relied on Rolodexes, you know, we relied on all this sort of uh, things that, that we don't rely on anymore, but where he is focusing on whether or not this person's business card is more important than his and this high level of competition down to, you know, even the business card, uh, you know, this person was constantly, I just think that the character was, you know, maybe the most uber form of uh, of this type of corporate person. And I, I just really think that I, I think it was amazing what they were able to do with it to keep it interesting and certainly to keep your attention. You had to concentrate while you were watching this film so you didn't miss a little nuance of something. And I think that it must've been a lot of fun to make this film because of that stringent work ethic in trying to get that perfect. He had to be perfect. His eyes couldn't have been in the wrong place. He can't dilly dally. He has to hold himself a certain way. His appearance is almost as important as everything he did. The way he looked, the way he spoke, all of his hair had to be in perfect alignment. It was just amazing looking at this performance. And you know that's what made this film so special to me is that production value of of everything being perfection and you know i think he he that's why he's one of the most intriguing characters i think in cinema today um yeah i think that this i mean he'd been around for a while but this was definitely his breakout role people were like wow you know like it, perfect absolutely it was it was perfect and you know i i'd seen christian bale and i think it was was it empire of the sun yeah, when he was a kid, I saw him in that film, and I was impressed with him because he's just a little boy. And but the the material, the weight of the material he was playing was incredibly heavy, and yeah. he still managed to kind of like still have this childlike uh, thing of it while people around him are are dying. Like he, I'm like for a child, he's seeing a lot of death, um, and and still going strong. But um, certainly, um, I think that Wall Street era, and you know, I I do live in New York. And I do remember New York at this time period. And I've 
I used to work in Manhattan. I did work for not a Wall Street firm, but for some other firms uh, that would, yeah, actually I did work for maybe one or two, but uh, not, I wasn't a full-time employee. I was trying to figure out whether I was going to go into this world of finance. And I have experienced seeing these young men like this certainly makes you fearful um, thinking about the capabilities of what they're doing, but they are alpha males, Catherine. And these, some of these guys can do anything. You know, they really have the ability to do, you know, true may not be the right thing he was doing in the film. But the point is, is that they have amazing abilities of doing stuff like this. And I think for just from a film perspective alone was incredibly entertaining to watch. Even just the color palettes of it, where everything is, it seems very clean and beautiful knowing very well what's going to happen um, is was exciting to see. And I think Bale does just such a spectacular job of pulling it off and, you know, just keeping his cool and, and looking amazing. He's attractive. You know, you see these men in suits and I kind of miss seeing guys in uh, a lot of this um, clothing choices, but certainly it was a film that just absolutely, um, shocked everybody in its popularity and still has so many standout performances to this day. Yeah, for sure. Um, and, and again, like that, like you mentioned, it, it is very much critiquing that whole corporate wall street culture, but this is your, you know, 2000 where a lot of people, you think of that, their mind tends to go to the eighties, but it, no, this is like your 2000 and, uh, and all the supporting performances were great as well. Very well cast. Uh, so that, that, th th this is still holds up. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Chloe Segovny obviously uh, would be the one uh, other character that I have to say was just absolutely brilliant in this. Of course, everybody was brilliant in this. Um, right. But uh, certainly um, it was honestly it's, it, you know, when I think about the idea of what's important to uh, a person in his position, someone who is doing uh, what he's doing, this is exactly how if this person existed would be. So, you know, it, he doesn't seem, you know, unfit or out of character for a yuppie of that era. Yeah, for sure. Uh, next choice. This is another classic national Lampoon animal house. <laughs> um, but, 4k. Yeah. Uh, I mean, what this is, it's like a, the ultimate college movie basically, or but more like college, like, you know, frat house culture and all of that. Uh, John Belushi, in a. a his most memorable role, arguably. And it's a very irreverent film. It's like, yeah, there's a plot, but does anybody really care about the plot? It's about the insanity and all of the hijinks. I remember seeing this film and thinking that this can't really exist, can it? And then I remember in 2008, I went up to Chico State University and walking through the neighborhood, and you see all the frat houses and the, the sorority houses, and I'm looking around, and you see all the beer bottles and stuff on the lawn, and I'm like, oh my God, this place, this, it's real, <laughs> you know? Because uh, I went to commuter schools for the college, so none of the – well, we did have sororities and frats that would advertise during, like, you know, uh, club week. Uh, I, I had no idea where they were actually based out of because it was – again, it was commuter schools. But th this is just it, – it's irreverent, balls to the wall insanity, and it's like, man, you don't have parties, college parties like this anymore. Uh, arguably na na the best movie to come out of the Lam National Lampoon franchise. Yeah, and um, it is certainly a, it's a comedy of what what was going on in um, college campuses. And like you, I also went to a commuter school, so I never lived in a dorm or on campus or anything. Like that. Though I spent like a lot of hours on campus, as, as I'm sure you have. Oh yeah. Um, but uh, certainly, this is a different experience, and you know, it is meant to be a comedy to kind of look at you know what's happening. And of course, you know, the school, the the whole idea that the this the fraternity is in trouble because they're on probation um, and all that sort of stuff is actually pretty typical. It's not sort of out of character for a lot of these um, fraternities and sororities, uh, but certainly the, um, the actors in this make it seem like they are having the time of their lives. And I think that that, um, you know, is very interesting and fun to watch. And, um, I wonder how many people went into college thinking that this is how their college experience would be and did actually have this, you know, this film was made in, in I think the late seventies. So I'm sure. It, I think, yeah. 
in the 80s, this just was uh, just the fantasy of living a life like this away from home, away from your parents on a college campus must have been such an extraordinary and, and fun experience. And I think they capture a lot of that in the film. Um, so I, I have to say, I think people keep trying to make films like this, but they can't do it. Um, maybe because uh, once again, we've had such a, sh a shift in culture, even on college campuses, that it's not quite the same. There isn't that excessive feeling of freedom or uh, carefree feelings that we get um, anymore. So, you know, it's very interesting. I think this is uh, an American classic. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I want to transport myself back to 1978 and, and, and go on there and just kind of watch what's going on. You can do it anyway by just watching the film, but um, it does seem like, you know, something that a person could watch this and just enjoy it. It's, yeah. it's not anything to be taken too seriously. Although the outcome of some of the uh, characters is different. Uh, they made a point of letting you know uh, what happens to some of them, but uh, certainly it is very interesting. Um, I don't think anybody does anything, had there any actions without consequences in the film too. So yeah. um, the fact that they're on probation tells you that there are consequences to what they're doing and they're going in with this, with, you know, their eyes open. So, uh, you know, I think that's also a very interesting element of a comedy uh, that chooses to do that. So I just, you, you won't stop laughing with this film. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, quite, yeah, it, it's hysterical. It's, it's like you either roll with it or you don't. And even as somebody, I didn't see this movie until I was already in college. I was aware of it and aware, without even realizing that I was aware of some of the jokes that originated from this movie. But watching it, it's like you don't have to be of that life or been in that life to really get it and to have a lot of fun with it. So that, that's, you know, fantastic. Uh, and you're right that the fact that they do actually have consequences, it's not just, you know, college all this. Uh, this next one, I would say, is easily Ron Howard's best film, Apollo 13. Uh, this is the 4K that got put out a couple years ago. A uh, little a nice, glossy, shiny still book. This is for the 25th anniversary. I did see this in theaters when it originally was released in summer of 95. Uh, I, I, there's not enough I can say good. Like, it doesn't matter how many times I've seen this movie. I'm constantly engaged by it all the way through. The only complaint I had is that I felt they should have had the reunion between uh, Jim Lovell and, and Marilyn at the end of the film and his kids because they put so much time into them worrying about him, all this kind of stuff. that it's like, I feel that's something the movie needed. But other than that, it's I think this is a master class in editing. It maintains the suspense and the engagement all the way through. They make all the NASA rocket, the actual rocket science tenable for the audience, but not in a way that they're, they're not dumbing it down to like a lot of modern films might do it. Like I have three huge books from NASA downstairs that they published in the eighties about the early history of rocket science and all that. And I, I love that astronomy was my first uh, astronomy was my first obsession as a kid until I grew up and realized that it takes forever to get answers back from space. So I'm like, I'm good. I'll pick a different career. <laughs> but uh, I, I think th this is a great movie, uh, very well done characters. Uh, and the fact that they did shoot this in like zero G with numerous airplane flights to make it feel real to the audience, I thought was really impressive. Uh, in the, in the just it, it's fantastic, uh, and the performances like it, particularly uh, uh, oh, like an Ed Harris as the the lead there, uh, amazing. Gary Sinise, one of my favorite roles that he was in, it, and the score by James Horner is just top notch. I, I don't think Ron Howard, this is the one. You know, a lot of people say Ron Howard it feels like a safe director, and a lot of his movies are fine, safe. This is the only one that I feel elevates beyond that. Like this goes from just being. It doesn't just feel okay, ho hum safe. This is great. And I, I, the four and a half out of five for me. Uh, I love this movie. Yeah, I also, like you, I also saw Apollo 13 in the movie theaters when it came out. And it really was um, so much better than how they advertised it, Catherine. Um, you know, and I don't know uh, if at the time, I think maybe the space program was still going on. Um, you know, we still had a space program that was active, meaning um, the space shuttle and everything, I think. Yeah. But for me, what made this so interesting was just, uh, and I think I saw, I might have seen this in IMAX, I'm not sure. But the the way that they filmed this, it was incredible. Um, when you do see it in a movie theater and you get to see them inside of, you know, it's just the three men who are in there and what they had to deal with, of course, they lose power. And so they're, it's freezing cold. And one guy is sick, like he's sick. And, um, you know, they're eating frozen 
hot dogs, you know, like it's, it's not palatable. And meanwhile, Gary Sinise is uh, back in NASA trying to, you know, use his engineering skills to get them out of there under what was it? Seven Watts or nine Watts. Like it's a really low it's number. Three or four, like he, he's trying to figure out, is it three or four amps? This is also a good example of composite characters. Cause while, while Gary Sinise, Ken Mattingly, very real, there of course were dozens. Like I had everybody working on trying to solve this problem. Uh, because, it, and I think that a lot of people have forgotten about it too. I watched a, a movie reaction video to this the other day on Real Rejects, and they're like, is this a true story? And then they look it up, and I'm like, oh my God, you didn't really ask that question. Did this you? is one of the most famous One stories. of the most famous, and it's maybe like... This, I'm it, sorry, maybe the only one that's more famous than this, and, and it's very incredibly tragic, is when they're still on the, the launch pad. And oh, yeah, Paul won. Yeah. Them yeah. End up, you know, perishing there. But this is maybe one of the most famous... Um, something goes wrong and we're going to get you home guys stories. Is that, that well, makes say it's the, the successful failure is what it was called. And it was just a simple wiring issue a couple of years before during manufacture. It's like, Oh geez, you know, mm -hmm. but it's just the fact that they were able to solve this. Like when you have that great scene where the, you have the, you know, the brain trust gets together and it's like, we need to figure out how to make this fit into the, the filter for this using nothing but that. <laughs> and uh, it's like, man, it's just back when, like they have the, you know, the steely eyed missile man, if you will. And that's kind of, it does capture that culture, which admittedly is very dated. I mean, you, you took a movie like hidden figures to remind you that it wasn't as white and pale as the movie makes it seem. Mm -hmm. But uh, I still think this, this is a, like you said, it's a people in peril. How do you bring them home? The best version of that for me. for my And money. There, this is another film with a lot of close-ups uh, because essentially they're in this pod, all three of them together. I can't remember at some point they had to leave the Lem or the Lem was there and they had to use the whatever parts they had to, you know, say, oh, we're not going to have a landing or, and remember something else that was really interesting about the film was there wasn't, at least this is what they implied. And I don't know if this is entirely true, Catherine, but maybe it was, they implied that there wasn't as much interest in this particular launch as in previous launches. And, you know, the, the crew didn't know this. So, right. you know, they're kind of like broadcasting and they're in space and this sort of stuff. And, you know, all of a sudden there's no focus on that. But then when it's reported that, you know, there was this trouble, now all of a sudden there was renewed interest in that. And so it became something for people to kind of, you know, get Which behind it. It's easy to think because Apollo 11 was in July 69. This happened in April 1970. So we're not even two years. We're, not, we're barely, not, not even a year. It's like you're six months later and people are already losing interest. It's like, really? It's like, how spoiled is the culture back then to not care? But that's what it was. And, uh, and that was accurate at the time. So, you know, I guess people felt like we've been to the moon. We made it. They brought back moon rocks on Apollo 11. Why are you going back? And while that is a valid question, because it is true, but it's like you get the, you get the moon rocks, you got the moon dust, you've landed there. It's sort of like I go back to the old Nevada testing sites. Like, what did you learn on the 600th nuclear bomb test that you didn't learn on the 296th? You know, it's kind of ridiculous. Uh, or it is ridiculous. But th this is still, uh, it doesn't, it, it, like you mentioned, it alludes to the idea that people aren't as interested anymore. It doesn't really dive into the whole controversy of, you know, what should they be spending the budget on this, blah, blah, blah. Because obviously NASA funding has led to all sorts of great things that we take for granted today that they don't that maybe they could do a PR campaign to advertise that for the people who don't really know that. But uh, still, I think this is, you know, a masterclass in editing and keeping your engagement up. And then the, the performance is top notch. Best Ron Howard film. I don't think he's going to top it. Yeah. I don't think, I don't think he's going to top it. It's definitely one of the best, um, let's say historical NASA films ever made. Uh, if we can create that category, because they have a lot of, um, uh, historical uh, NASA films out there. And I think this one was very, very special. Uh, certainly uh, beautiful performances. And like I said, the cinematography, as you mentioned, I remember going to, um, I think it's um, uh, the, oh, it's uh, one of the museums in Manhattan. I, the name of the museum. Oh, it's the American Museum of Natural History. Mm -hmm. And in the, um, inside of the, uh, there's one area where there's the Hayden Planetarium, which which a lot of people know of. And then outside of that, there's an area where they have photographs that were taken of the moon and, and during space exploration. And I like to go see it because they composited like a lot of the photos to make it look like it was wide angle shots. 
Mm -hmm. And this film feels like it's one giant wide angle shot. Like mm -hmm. you really do feel like you're out in space when you're watching it. So well, especially, I'm glad to see. especially the rocket launch sequence when they take off is so breathtaking. And the camera actually has the shake and the shutters with it, which I don't have surround sound up here, but if you did, it would be like an <laughs> unbelievably thunderous and amazing. And that shot that admittedly that was a CG shot when the camera's panning down as everything's breaking away, but it looks magnificent, you know? And, and that's 1995 CG tech, and it looks a lot better than a lot of stuff you see today. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so I certainly do love that film. I think it's another essential um, seeing something like that. We were very lucky to get that film. Um, honestly, the quality of it looks uh, amazing as well. I remember being in the theater just like you and looking at the quality of what we were seeing, and it was I knew it was top notch at the time. So um you know, just really such a treat to see that level of quality in 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 cinematography and film for for that particular uh, movie yeah. as well. So uh, my next film is a movie that is not ashamed to let its freak flag fly, and that is Aquaman. By ah, yes, <laughs> I had yeah. not ever read an Aquaman comic. I was familiar with it more from all the jokes that have been made in TV shows and stuff over the years. Like, yeah, well, you can talk to fish, whatever. But casting Jason Momoa and seeing that first trailer, it's like. Oh, wow. And this is dives into comic book territory I'm usually not into. Like, I have a ton of Batman comics over there. But I'm not into the supernatural as much. But watching this, it, it just, it's like, no, we're not going to half-ass it. We're going to do a deep dive on this insane stuff. And you're either on board for it or you're not. And I was on board for it the whole ride. Most of the film is admittedly CG, but it, I was absorbed by the story. It's just kind of engaged with just how s the silliness of it. And then it's just going to, how can we top ourselves, you know, scene by scene? And yet they, they find a way to do it with the levels of absurdity. Like even in the beginning when the, the Black Manta's father is dying, he's like, no, son, you need to survive so you can kill that son of a bitch. <laughs> and it's like, it's hilarious. And uh, admittedly, I don't like the motive of the Black Manta character. He's basically like, you killed my father. And it's like, dude, you're a hypocrite. You go around killing people. You're a pirate. Like Aquaman says, you're pirates and you kill the innocent. You beg the sea for mercy. I love that line. But it's just, I thought it was just a really fun movie. It doesn't care what anybody else thinks about it. It's just going for it. No holds barred, all, all in. Well, there's a reason why this film made a billion dollars, Catherine. And it's for all the reasons you mentioned. And certainly we cannot deny the star power of Jason Momoa. And I think that there were a lot of great uh, actors in this film, but I just can't take my eyes off of Jason Momoa. I think he is convinced us he is Aquaman and maybe a real life superhero even. Um, and I don't think I've seen this type of sensationalism in an actor uh, for some time. Sometimes uh, actors would get a role. You know, Jason Momoa has made a lot of films before this and after this. And sometimes an actor can get a role and, you know, that might be the role that they're known for. And obviously he is known for this role. It's just that, you know, I really do believe that there's a certain element of Jason Momoa um, that made this film a success. And they played off a lot of the notion, you know, obviously his looks and his uh, personality, but he certainly does, um, he doesn't look like the traditional Aquaman, which looks very different, Catherine. Um, you know, usually, and that's fine, you know, they have a different well, depiction of Aquaman in the I comics. I think that was also part of it, having to shake the whole, the joke of Aquaman that had been around, because he always looked the same. And just, you're just like a regular guy just wearing a fish suit and you're in the water. And so like, how do we break that? It's like, we'll cast Jason Momoa, like super ripped, like totally, uh, and, and like something completely different. Cause they don't even want you to, even his outfit doesn't look the same until towards the end of the movie. Cause they don't want you thinking about that old Aquaman. They're trying to make it feel very different from all those jokes of Aquaman and the old cartoons over the years. And so, so that by the time he finally does get the classic suit at the end, you're not prone to thinking of it. Oh, we're the jokey Aquaman. No, you're 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 all in on Jason Momoa as this totally rethought version of the character. So I think that's also very deliberate. Yeah, it is very deliberate, and it's done to perfection. And you know, obviously, um, you can't forget the first time you see Jason Momoa kind of coming out of the water. Um, that scene, which I think uh, you just 
right then and there, you were bought into this film. I think no matter what happened before or after that, it, it almost didn't matter. Um, he just is absolutely mesmerizing. And that's not the case for every actor who plays a superhero. We've had some brilliant actors take on different roles, but this was very different. I think um, this might be <laughs> in the vein of, um, I'm trying to think of someone, you know, honestly, it was really maybe just a, a movie about the, the brawniness of, of male uh, bravado. And I think that, that a lot of the film, although it's in the water, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's an aquatic based film, if you will, um, does focus on his physique and his power in a literal sense, literally you get a, a sense of his, his strength and his um, importance by his appearance, which is something that, you know, I think we've had, like I said, a lot of other successful actors do this, but not to the level of perfection that Momoa seems to have accomplished it. And I, I whoever, you know, that you, you get a star who's going to play a role and there's a lot of ways you can depict that, that character, but they played up on all of Momoa's um, uh, strengths in this. And I think that that also uh, attributed to the success of the film and why it made over a billion dollars, which um, is a lot of money. It was in 2018 uh, that the film came out. And, you know, I can't stop. I've, I've seen the film several times and I absolutely love the film. And I'm looking forward to the next one, Catherine, which is coming out this year and Christmas Day, right? It's coming out on Christmas Day. Yeah. I'm looking forward to this. Uh, certainly, I think that um, Momoa can do nothing wrong in this with this character because he's made it such a success, a transformation, as you say, Catherine, maybe even a rebranding of Aquaman. Yeah, that's uh, why I'm going to miss him in this role because, you know, he's it's the news has since broke. He's going to be playing a different character in the DCU. So uh, I am looking forward to it. Ho hopefully it's really good. Uh, but yeah, it's like you just reinvented the character and Hopefully that will carry over to whenever they choose to revisit this IP. But uh, yeah, the, the, he was really great in this. Yeah, and and I think both you and I know we're we're not ever going to get another person like Jason Momoa to play this role to fruition like this. This yeah. was, uh, you know, something that we were lucky to see in our lifetime. We've gotten two films out of this. Um, we're very lucky to even get one oftentimes, but, uh, yeah, the film I think is superhero perfection for me. Um, certainly in a way that none of us expected it would be brought out in color tones and palettes that are almost haunting. Like they've got a little bit of a fantasy feel to it. Um, you know, you want to go into that water, you know, I normally, I don't want to dive into the ocean. Normally I don't want to do anything like that. I want to go in there and see if he's really in there, Catherine, after seeing this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure most people want to see that. Uh, let's see if that's there. Uh, this next film is a cult, a beloved cult classic of the, uh, uh, of the Bruce Campbell variety. We have Army of Darkness. Yes. Uh, yes. Recently released 4K steelbook. Uh Yes, the, the, I you know I wasn't really a big fan of the first two Evil Dead movies. I this is a lot of, like Ford is set. I appreciate the first uh, the the uh, first two Evil Dead movies for how low budget and how they were made, but I didn't really connect with it. But Army of Darkness is the one where it's like okay, if you're gonna do if this is your concept of what these monsters are and where they're coming from, let's just go all in. And so. It is all in again. Another movie that lets us freak flag fly. It's the King of the B, Bruce Campbell King of the B movies, and, and this it, like going to hell and fighting all these demons. So it's like, what's not to like about this movie? Absolutely, and of course, it is a huge. It's 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 a fantasy that is just so out there. Um, you know, being transported back in time, so to speak. Um, I just love it. I think that. It, you're, you're right. It is a B movie, but we need B movies like this. If you're going to do a B movie, let it be like this. Let it be this incredible experience. Um, let it go ahead and, and let us see, you know, he, he has this incredible uh, shotgun and chainsaw and all sorts of different tools and things. Um, I think it's amazing. I think what they did uh, with it was spectacular. And, um, you know, I kind of, I have to say that we need to have these sort of spectacular characters 
uh, that can give us these fantasies. You know, it, it can't be sort of just an ordinary person. It has to be something that is very theatrical, very out there. I think they accomplished that in this. And it's just wonderful that we even got this. I love that film. Um, and you're right. Uh, it just really is something that uh, it, it, a lot of people would say it's a B movie. I think that for that type of genre, um, even with its uh, cult following, let's say, um, it really has had a huge influence, um, you know, on, let's say, horror, if you will, if you want to call it, um, you know, a horror film, uh, horror, maybe, I, it's not comedy, but it's, um, I'm, I'm having difficulty. I yeah, it's kind of, I mean, it's tr It's not a comedy explicitly, but the way he plays the role and just how goofy it is, you can't help. It's not a movie that you're like scared to watch. It's it's just fun. It's just, if you like this type of iconography, uh, it's like Jason A. Argonauts um, in hell, basically. And then you're just totally on board with it. Um, yeah, it, it really is. And I think that that is very interesting to uh, the goofiness aspect of it. However, you know, even with the goofiness of it, you know, he has to be serious and kill these creatures. This is not something that is um, entirely uh, irresponsible. You know, like he has a mission and, mm. you know, it's, it's, I just think it's a, a fantastic film. And, you know, this is uh, really, um, I love fantasy like this and I especially love dark fantasy and it's made for an adult audience. Um, I, I just really think it's wonderful to watch. Mm hmm yeah, this is just a, a a true gem. I'm glad they put this out on a, a nice steelbook that does all, also reflect the insanity of what it is you're watching. <laughs> uh, let's see what else we got here. Only a couple left here. We have uh, all right. So we have uh, let's see where is it. All right, so I have two two of them to show off here. Uh, uh, both versions of Aladdin. We have the classic one from the Disney Renaissance, one of the best of the Disney Renaissance. Yes. The remake, the live action remake, which feels a bit more like a Disney on Ice performance type thing, but I saw this image and I'm like, this is gorgeous looking. One of the most gorgeous looking steel books I have, even though I'm not really a fan of the movie. Uh, but I thought that this was something that I, got, I can't pass this up on Steelbook. It looks too just look at that poster. That is gorgeous. It looks stunning. And that's the one with Will Smith, right? Yes. Uh, and the only performances I liked in this, this one were him and the actress playing the the handmaiden who he has like a, a romantic interest. I thought they were both good. And the rest of it is kind of, you know, like a lot of these Disney remakes feels a bit hollow, a bit, a lot of overacting. And, you know, they do a twist with the villain, like they always do in these new live action remakes that they do, that doesn't go anywhere. But I, again, from, as somebody who likes collecting steel books and the ones that look beautiful, I couldn't pass that up. Uh, and even with the nice red chinge down the spine, but the one that I really talk about here is the, of course, the original, uh, or the, the original from the, the Disney version with Robin Williams, uh, a really great movie. Uh, I, I saw this in theaters back in, uh, I believe, what, 1992? Um, I believe so, yeah. 30, this was the, I think they put this out the year before the 30th anniversary, but uh, I, I think this is a really good, one of the better Disney animated films of the Disney Renaissance. Uh, and it, yeah, I, I love it. The, I mean, Robin Williams, it's like a perfect advertisement for everything that made Robin Williams amazing <laughs> that you just show. And it's funny how you've seen Robin Williams do c comedies, which are more like towards R rated comedy, but you also see him do family comedy, but this feels like a good representation. If you don't know who he is, th this is Robin Williams. And it's like it, reminder that he is a living, breathing cartoon character. That's how amazing he was. And th th this being the best. And uh, I love his commitment to it because he wasn't interested in the merchandising angle, which is why he didn't come back for the first sequel, but uh, a, great, a great movie. <laughs> yeah, um, I never saw the live action one, but of course I have seen the Disney version uh, with Robin Williams in it, and it's spectacular. It's a perfect film. Uh, you are right about many of these Disney live action remakes feeling very empty. Um, there is something missing, and I don't know why it feels like there's something missing, but it's just not the same. Disney used to be able to remake films, and they used to come out fantastic. So there is something that they're missing in their uh, development process as well as, uh, you know, the let's say the production and post-production that something is off and it's not included for whatever reason. It might be um, having certain people who are more mature or, you know, have the experience of how to make these films feel, uh, uh, you know, more original even um, 
or have that same original feeling that the old ones had. So something is missing in that team and it does make uh, a big difference in the outcome. But certainly, um, yeah, I guess if Robin Williams had to be any character, it would be a cartoon character. Um, <laughs> he, I remember um, seeing him all in all those years and all the films he's ever made, but honestly, um, in comic relief, uh, sometimes he'd do these comic relief shows and you could really see uh, even more of his personality and as they would just kind of improv a lot of that stuff in comic relief and uh but robin williams is known for his stand-up as well as in movies dramatic and comedy so he could do pretty much everything and it's not a surprise that he would be a pick for aladdin uh in the movie so um you know he made it come alive and knowing it's him it, it does feel like they've kind of captured a little the essence of robin williams in it uh that and that makes it so enjoyable um, you know, the genie is a character that's very special and has a lot of uh, different types of significance in regards to culture and influence and abilities. Um, although, you know, they, they're not going to go deep into the ability of a genie, but a genie is not an ordinary being. So, um, well, yeah, they did adapt. The, obviously, it's a Disney-fied version of the original story. And, it, it, you know, it's not really... Uh, the culture isn't really portrayed as much either. Like in the remake, they make a big deal about how he does, how uh, how the Sultan feels that Jasmine can't be the leader. But actually, in certain Arab countries, if you were of royalty, of royal birth, it didn't matter if you were a woman; you could still lead. So that was like a a, a misrepresentation in a sense. It's like no, if she was a woman, she would still be allowed to do that if you're of royal blood. Here, I mean, I wouldn't. I mean, I wouldn't show this to anybody as an example of other foreign culture because again, it's just <laughs> watered down. And, but uh, it's again, it's really just class a D disney renaissance and uh a, a comeback they really needed as well because of how the studio had been waning years but yeah th enough great can't be said about this but the ultimate testament i think to robin williams talent uh is like you you see him in like the anime the videos of him in the animation booth doing the voice and he's just balls to the wall insane like like you see his improv shows and people are like that's like a cartoon character i'm like yeah he is a cartoon character. Yes. <laughs> and, it, and you can see how, um, and from what I've understood in the past, Catherine, is that they would be filmed while they're doing it. And then sometimes they would mimic the movements of the actor to match that of the cartoon character, if I'm not mistaken. And I can see them doing that with Robert Rooms. Oh, we got to get that. We have to get that. That's really creative. I couldn't have thought to move the character like that. That's how he would move. He'd be the perfect actor I'd want to film while he was doing all these gestures and movements, knowing very well that they're authentic gestures and movements in his interpretation of the character. So I'm, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if a good 90% of what we're seeing is those actual movements from Robin Williams translated to the animation uh, by the animators who also were equally talented at a time when they still, it was still hand-drawn, right? At that time. So um, I think The Little Mermaid might have been the, the last one that was hand-drawn, but um, certainly a lot of that special treatment comes across in, in a film like that. In yeah, because they were still doing, like, I know that uh, hand-drawn animation, yeah, that might have been The Little Mermaid, maybe been the last. This line came afterwards, three years later, but it's a bit of hand-drawn and mixed with the computer cell, but it still has that same, two, you know, classic animation look to it. Uh, yes. That I miss. I wish they would go back to doing more of that. I don't like that it's so much... It, it, it mean, yeah, 3D CGI, Pixar does that really well, but just because Pixar does it doesn't mean everybody has to do it. Exactly. Um, and it, I think you make a good point with that. So I certainly do love that uh, that animated film, uh, which is just so wonderful. It's certainly another Disney classic, which we which we are accustomed to seeing. So so that was wonderful to see that one, too. Yeah, for sure. And now the uh, the last film of today, uh, a steelbook from Denny Villeneuve, Arrival. Uh, now, the plot of this film, it, it's basically the same as a lot of 50s sci-fi type plots where there's aliens here, we don't know what to do about it, we gotta get the scientific expert to try and communicate, blah blah blah. But the design is very unique. Uh, very, and I don't know if he intended it, and I don't know if you felt this way too, I guess the final twist within the first 10 minutes. Because the fact that they made a point, spoilers, of uh, not showing the husband in the beginning. Like she says, no, go ask your dad how to do this. And her, her job title was so unique that I don't think it's ever been seen in a movie before that when it cut to them on the airplane, the Jeremy, oh, okay, he's the father, got it. And it's like, I did. So, it, Which is why I didn't feel as much of a shock at the end when that turned out to be what it was because I kind of saw it coming. But I love this kind of, the, how, how she's interacting with the aliens. And it's just like the, the black liquid kind of in the 
you know, in the mix type of thing. And uh, admittedly, the story is a bit telegraphed, but uh, I do love the design of the film. I, I do think it's style over substance, but that's not always a bad thing. Even though this is probably and this is probably one of the my, enough that this would probably be on the bottom, but it's still it's still entertaining. Yeah, um, I enjoyed this film too. And, you know, I think at the time it was made, uh, I'm not exactly sure how it was received. I know it did uh, pretty well, but- It um, was honestly, very well by the by the public. It, 2016, everybody, I was like the lone, the lone one out that wasn't as impressed. I actually got this on a discount. Uh, and I'm like, oh, I'll give it another shot. Uh, it, but everybody loved this movie, it seems, when it came out. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that- um, I think that the performances in the film uh, certainly were something that really pushed you into believing that this, the importance of what was going on. And so, um, you know, the shape of this, of what you were seeing, maybe may not have been entirely relatable, um, but certainly I remember watching this film. It's been a while since I've seen this film and I enjoyed it very much. Um, certainly I think it was worth uh, watching. And I, I'm a lot of this stuff is kind of, um, I'm trying to remember all the particulars of the film, um, but I think uh, Amy Adams did a wonderful job in the film. Um, uh, I don't know if, um, I, I didn't know Denny Villeneuve actually uh, was involved in this film, but um, anything he seems to be involved in, uh, he puts 110% into. So I'm not surprised of the quality of the film and, you know, with what he's trying to achieve, you know, he doesn't do anything sort of like half-assed or anything like that. He really goes well into it and, and wants to produce a product that's amazing. But, um, you know, it kind of reminded me of Contact. I, I hope I'm saying the right um, uh, film. It yeah. kind of reminded me of Contact. It had a, a kind of feel to that where, um, I, and I'm not even quite sure what's interesting you can about have the same subplot with the, the crazy weirdo who comes to try and blow things up and stop. That, that's kind of part of Part of what bugged me about this movie is that you're copying other movies very similar beat for beat. And the only thing I felt was different about it was the the design and then like the job title of the character was so unique. But again, I, I guess the twist so early that I'm pretty sure that wasn't the intention, but it's like, yeah, they got it, you know, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that you're, you're, that's the right film that you're thinking of there. Okay. So, um, you know, the thing that I also thought was very interesting is the idea that, you know, the Amy Adams character, if I remember correctly, has the ability to contact, uh, to, to have some type of contact with these aliens. And, and so, um, it's not, not everybody can communicate with them. And so that was another thing that was very different. And, and, it makes sense because of what they sent. Um, you know that not everybody's going to be able to communicate with them. I think sometimes when they choose certain structures in films and they say, okay, here, it's an obelisk. And, you know, and it, it doesn't necessarily feel like we can contact or, or have communication with a, with an alien, but someone gets it. You know, it's like close to the counter in close encounters, someone got it. There was one person who got it who knew that he could have contact with this person. So out of the billions of people on earth, there's going to be one person who can do it. And, you know, this is one of those stories, uh, but it was very well made film, very entertaining to watch. I enjoy the film. It has to be, I don't remember when I saw this film, um, but it was a while ago. Um, it, it, at least it feels like it's a while ago. Um, but That's certainly a lot of years ago now. A lot of people were, were, you know, it was nominated for so many awards, uh, Catherine. Uh, and I think a lot of people acknowledged that it really had this great feel to it that it deserved to get. I think it, I think it was nominated for Best Cinematography at some point or. Um, a cinematography, visual effects, maybe sound. I can't remember. I'd have to go back and check. But uh, yeah, it got a lot of it got a lot of buzz. Yeah, it really did. So I think it, it, it is a fantastic film. Definitely worth a, a rewatch. Um, I'm going to watch it again. Um, so, yeah, I think it's a great choice of film, uh, Catherine. Really, yeah. really well done. And the, of course, there's more in the letter A. I just picked the ones that figure would have the most titles. Like other films I have in the letter A would be uh, Air Force One, The A-Team, Ad Astra, Age of Adeline, Amazing Spider-Man 1 and 2, American Hustle, American Sniper, Argo, the Austin Powers trilogy. But I, I just picked the ones that I thought the, the seal books, especially, I always show off. And then some of the other regular case ones I figured would generate conversation. I hope to get the Air Force One steelbook. That just came out. That looks amazing. But <laughs> that would be a double dip if I do it. But uh, 
but yeah, those are, that's that's basically the the highlights of my letter A collection for my uh, for this today, excluding bigger box sets, which we'll get to eventually. But yes. Well, absolutely. Well, Catherine, thank you for sharing uh, such wonderful picks from your uh, you know physical media collection. Um, it's been such a pleasure to talk to you about these films, which are all spectacular films. Uh, so great to have those at your fingertips. <laughs> play whenever you like uh, and not have to rely on, you know, the streaming services, which are streaming services are okay. But I do like the uh, fact that you have the ability to just pull off whatever you want from the shelf mm -hmm. and pop it into the player and watch it and enjoy it. So I so do appreciate that. Catherine, where can people find you? You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube at Sly Snide. You could find me on the Virtual Cantina Network every second and fourth Sunday of the month on the Unifying Force, a Star Wars talk show live streaming at 8 a.m. Pacific, which we just did our latest episode this morning. Uh, you can also find me on the, the Phantasmagorium show currently on Tuesday nights with our Batman series, Capes, Cows, and Crusaders. Uh, Lego Batman movie will be our next one coming up on Tuesday. We also have the Martinis, Gadgets, and Guns playlist for all the James Bond stuff we did and uh, Bullets, Blades, and Babes for all of our Tarantino, Robert Rodriguez stuff we did. And uh, we got another series coming up at the start of next month. So, uh, And we'll be moving back to Wednesdays beginning in April. But that's you can always find us there. Uh, so, that yeah, it's fun. Come check us out. We're uh, probably going to do a spoiler discussion of 65 and Scream 6 later today, perhaps. Oh, fantastic. That 65 poster sold me right away with uh, Adam Driver on the cover. Um, it felt like something like 10,000 years, or it actually reminded me of Predators. That's That mm -hmm. that poster reminded me of Predators because they're all kind of like transported to a place where they don't know that they're going to be transported to. So uh, seeing Adam Driver on the cover, gee, he looks so good in movie posters. He really mm -hmm. does uh, sell whatever film he's in as far as I'm concerned. I even liked him in Star Wars, so I don't know. I yeah. thought he was a good Kylo Ren, you know. Yeah, I thought he was the best like actor performer in that trilogy, yeah. Yeah, he really is remarkable. So um, he's in that. I, I actually recently saw him in, um, gee, it was, uh, it's not a marriage story, but it was a movie on Netflix about, uh, about was it about an alien encounter too? Um, it oh, might have been. Is, that is it? Was it? Is that, that was what something it? similar, but I am, uh, oh no, are you, oh, I know what you're talking about. You're talking about the new one, White Noise? Yes, White Noise. Um, I saw him in it. I liked him in that. Um, I yeah, thought it was great. In all the movies that he's in, even if the movies themselves uh, aren't always up to snuff. But uh, uh, yeah, I, I yeah, kind of like kind of like sixty five. I thought was a bit of a letdown, but he was good. You know, he's always good. <laughs> always <right>. Well, <laughs> I can't wait to see your review of of sixty five, and of course. Um, uh, you and I will be continuing this series. I just want to thank everybody for watching uh, Cat's Corner, episode one. And please uh, make sure you turn up for episode two as we continue looking at your extensive physical media collection and review some of the gems that you have there, the movies that you guys definitely should check out. So, Catherine, thank you so much for um, doing the recording today. And um, Everybody watching, thank you for uh, turning up to watch the show. Um, and guys, remember, no matter where you are in the galaxy, always remember to please be kind. Take care, everybody.